Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Clocked In With The Press, hosted at Altman Studios in Brentwood, California. In this podcast, we highlight news stories, individuals, and organizations that deserve your attention. For full news stories and to stay updated on the latest Contra Costa County happenings, you can visit our website and Facebook at thepress.net or our Twitter and Instagram at Press Clocked In. We are your hosts, Caitlin Gleason and Melissa Van Ruten, clocking in. So the first news story that we have is that a man was safely removed uninjured from an underground pipe in a three and a half hour rescue effort by Contra Costa County firefighters in Antioch Sunday night, March 20th. At least 50 personnel from the Contra Costa County Fire Protection District, East Contra Costa Fire Protection District, Antioch Police Department, and City of Antioch Public Works Department worked to free the man from the pipe 16 feet under the ground in the area of 3160 Buchanan Road. Crews were first called to the scene around 5.30 p.m. The man in his mid-30s was extricated and appeared to be uninjured around 9 p.m., although he was transported to the hospital for evaluation. Crews did not divulge how or why the man was in the pipe. Photos from the scene showed the rescue required a front-loading tractor. Crews announced midway through the three-and-a-half-hour rescue effort that they were attempting to reach the man from two different directions. Later, the Contra Costa County Fire Protection District announced four firefighters went underground trying to clear debris to reach the man. So, Melissa, what do you think about this story? <laughs> um, so, this one was was kind of bonkers, right? I heard this all happening over the radio kind of in real time. Um, I Unfortunately, I had a photo session already scheduled, so mm. I wasn't able to make it out to the scene. Um, by the time I would have been able to, to make it out, they were actually just getting ready to—they to. to they had the, the guy in a harness, and they were just getting ready to pull him up. Mm. Um, so it was, it was really kind of crazy to, to hear. Um, I know initially when, uh, they were called out, it was because somebody had heard moaning coming from this pipe. Like and a, like a passerby had heard I, the guy I, either a passerby or law enforcement. I'm, it's kind of unclear. They, mm. everybody is RP reporting person. Um, so police got out there, didn't hear it and were ready to call it. Oh. And the battalion chief said, no, we're here. We're going to kind of scope the area a little bit more and thankfully they did and, and they said, found oh, that he was in a pipe yeah he's still down there um and then after the fact i and you know this is just hearsay so take it as you will apparently this guy had to like climb into the other end of the pipe somewhere across the street like he crawled along this pipe until he couldn't go anymore because it was full of trash like they had people down in there pulling out trash and um just mm. like before like to they get could, there, it would to be get a lot. to him, right? To, so before they could even take him out, they had to rid all of this debris from the pipe in order to safely get down there. You know, there was a timer going to make sure that they weren't down. You know, oxygen mm-hmm. needs, etc. But it was just, it was, you know, and it it kind of brings to mind. I don't know, Caitlin. I know that you're a little younger than this, but for all us '80s kids, it it really brought baby Jessica to mind, that mm. 18 month old that fell down the the well. Oh. And they it was this cr- big crazy and I can like, vividly remember the photos from that, but thankfully he was he was good. Yeah, you thank- know, thankfully he uninjured, was uninjured, okay. a little dehydrated is what I heard and um you know, I think really the the big lesson here is don't crawl into storm drains or any drains mm. or any holes in the ground that you're not sure of or experienced with i guess yeah that's probably some good advice there (laughs) (laughs) um but how about the next story though uh next up the east contra costa fire protection district is slated to receive 1.5 million in federal funding and that's going to be used to construct their new station on empire avenue between grant street and amber lane here in brentwood officials haven't yet announced when the station the district's fifth will open While the district's strategic plan identifies a current need for six fire stations, the East Contra Costa Fire Protection District operates only three while serving a population of more than 128,000 in the cities of Brentwood and Oakley, and also covering unincorporated communities of Discovery Bay, Bethel Island, Knightson, Byron, Marsh Creek, and Morgan Territory. Construction on the district's fourth station, which sits at the corner of East Cypress and Bethel Island Roads in Oakley, was completed in 2019 However, there has been no money to staff the station and make it operational. However, with ECC FPD's annexation by Contra Costa Fire Protection District, otherwise known as CONFIRE, when that's official, it could change as soon as July 1st when the annexation is slated to officially start. Mm -hmm. 
You know, what's interesting about the um, this entire thing is how the, you know, because most people in the community really don't like taxes. I've come to find out, um, you know, while monitoring social media. Um, but it's interesting because Measure X, which started all this, is just so widely supported because yeah. um, Measure X, I think, establishes a 0.5 sales tax um, that will thus help with funding the annexation and funding the establishment of all these new stations. Well, I think the 0.5, it's on uh, property sales, if I'm not. Something, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's like an additional little... Yeah, no, so when I found out that that's kind of how the funding was going to be happening, I was like, oh, wow, everybody voted for that. Like, I'm actually proud of people in this community. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for supporting our firefighters. Yeah, so it's it's exciting to see that we'll be able to get a fifth station. Um, is there going to be a sixth one? Have they talked about Eventually, that? but I don't think that will happen until after the annexation. I know... It was talked a little bit about on the upcoming uh, podcast, the interview we did with Ross Maycumber. Mm-hmm. Um, they plan to eventually, I, I think they're going to tear down the old downtown station and rebuild it there. Just okay, because so they upgrade it a little yeah, yeah. bit. Oh, either tear down or upgrade what's already there. But basically, they already own that land. And as we all know, land in California ain't cheap. No, it is not. <laughs> I don't even own land, (laughs) and I'm afraid to try. (laughs) So the next story is that a Contra Costa County jury convicted 67-year-old Antioch resident Mitchell Lynn Baycom of the 1980 murder of 14-year-old Suzanne Bombardier, the oldest open homicide on record in Antioch. Having been convicted of first-degree murder, along with special circumstances for commission of the murder during the course of burglary, kidnapping, and rape, Bacon will be sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, according to the press release. Bacon, 27 years old at the time, was an early suspect in the initial murder investigation. The case went cold until 2017 when Bacon was identified as the perpetrator through a biological sample matched to his DNA profile. Bombardier disappeared from her sister's apartment in June of 1980, where she was babysitting her younger cousins. A week later, her body was recovered from the San Joaquin River. Along with the evidence of a sexual assault, the cause of death was determined to be a single stab wound to the chest. Baycom has previously been convicted in 1974 of rape and other felony offenses and was on parole for those offenses at the time of Bombardier's murder. In 1981, Baycom was convicted of a subsequent sexual assault and related felonies for which he was sentenced to 24 years in state prison. So this like blows my mind. I'm I'm totally uh, like a true crime. Oh, me junkie. too. I me listen too. to all the podcasts, you know, and and what they're able to do with DNA, st- you know, studies and testing, and it it just crazy. I mean, that's how they they caught the Golden State Killer. Mm-hmm. You know, it was a, a family member had submitted a for a DNA like a one of the twenty three and Me or Ancestry or whatever, and and that. It's good. It's, uh, mm-hmm. Ancestral DNA is is really pay- taking a huge leap in tre- like in in cold cases. Mm-hmm. Um, I think this one. It sounds like it's a little bit different. He sounds like he was already a, a not so pleasant person, and so I'm just glad that this family is able to get some closure with this case. Yeah, I think it's it's really impressive. I think on. Um, Antioch police because there are so many instances that I have heard about where cold cases just they, they never they, they cold, never get yeah. solved they sit and part of the problem is because of the lack of evidence or lack of DNA or the way the evidence doesn't get preserved once the case goes cold or you know there's just so many different various factors that make it so this way cold cases aren't you know they remain as they are and so for APD to be able to solve the oldest homicide cold case in the city um, and to just finally kind of find that consolation for the family, I think is just really great on their part. And, you know, just like props to them for all the hard work that they put in being able to solve that case. 100%. 100%. Absolutely. So next, this week, Antioch Mayor Lamar Thorpe was arrested on suspicion of drunken driving early on the morning of Saturday, March 19th. CHP patrol officers pulled over a gray Volvo driven by Thorpe traveling northbound on Interstate 680 near Monument Boulevard at approximately 1.15 a.m. on March 19th, the agency said in a press statement. Officers conducted a DUI investigation, and Thorpe was arrested for driving under the influence of alcohol. Thorpe was cited for violations of California Vehicle Code 23152 a VC and 23152B VC and released from custody at 3.35 a.m. Thorpe addressed the incident in a recorded statement on his Facebook page Saturday morning. 
He said, quote, I wanted to come before you today because I wanted to share some personal news. Last night, after having dinner with a friend, I was pulled over by the California Highway Patrol and cited for driving under the influence. For that, I take full responsibility. Under the advice of counsel, I am limited in what I can share with you, but I felt it was important to be open and direct with you. Although I never felt inhibited by the drink I had with my dinner, I am deeply sorry by my lapse of judgment, and I hope you can forgive me. Being your mayor is one of the greatest honors of my life, and I am sorry if I have embarrassed you in any way. You have my full commitment that I will grow and learn from this moment and continue to work diligently on behalf of the residents of Antioch, end quote. Yeah, it's a rough moment for the Antioch mayor. Yeah, this is not, uh, you know, and, and I'm sure, like even this, you know, it, mm-hmm. his name, I've seen it so many times in, in the last week, you know, since this occurrence happened. And uh, definitely not his finest moment. I definitely have a lot of opinions. You know, my best friend's mom was mm-hmm. killed by a drunk driver. Oh, I was hit. I almost died by a drunk driver. Yeah. Was, I think they remember they told me it was centimeters away oh. um, from <laughs> me being in the afterlife. Uh, <laughs> so it's... Just don't do it. It's yeah, that no, easy. Don't like, do it. And, and especially in the in the in the day and age of of Uber and Lyft and you know, all these these ride shares and I mean cabs. Cabs have always been a thing. You know, if you've been drinking or if you've been using cannabis, anything that will impair your driving, don't get behind a wheel. Like, come on. Yeah. Come on. We yeah, all went no, through I mean, you know, just school. Like, we all know this. Take the slumber of shame and sleep in your car if you have to. <laughs> but I don't <laughs> I, the amount of times I've slept in my car. I've knowledge. done it, you know. Um, you do what you have to do so that you're not driving. Yeah. I. It's going to be interesting to see how it plays out, though, because the, he's also in the middle of the recall election. Um, And so I think this was, you know, if I were to look at it from, like, his like PR manager's viewpoint, this is a nightmare <laughs> to have to deal with. Just a little bit. Um, to say, yeah, you're being you're in a recall election and and then he gets arrested yeah, I, for it for a DUI. So it's gonna be interesting how he kind of plays his cards to try and recover from this. I don't think that um, it's because gonna I think do him any favors. Well, because according to his statement, he still wants to you know, stay sure. elected and he wants to try and win the recall. So don't get me wrong. People mess up, people make mistakes. It's Some mistakes part, are a little worse than others. It, it's true. It's part of being human, and and it is good to see accountability being taken. Yeah. However, like you said, this is this is big. You know, this is a big mess up. This is you know, not only is it illegal, it's dangerous as all get out. You know, he whether he felt impaired or not. He could have seriously injured somebody or himself, you know, and then what? Then that not only, you know, he'd have to live with it for the rest of his life, but, you know, and and it goes back, you know, and then it would be a PR nightmare. (laughs) It would be a, you know, my my inner marketer is crying a little bit. Sure, sure. So why is he actually being recalled right now? So according to the the petition language, it cites the following reasons for the recall. Disrespect for council members and the public who disagree with him during city council meetings. Blocking constituents and not allowing them to comment on his social media. Uh, It also states he's failed to provide full support to the great men and women of the Antioch police, which then leads to them not being able to keep the city as safe as it should be. It also led to the resignation of police chief Tammany Brooks and also the announcement or the announced retirement of city manager Ron Bernal. He also proposed rescinding the school resource officer grant. He put that on the, the council agenda. He, but he did so without consulting Antioch Unified School District Board or the administration after the officer had already been interviewed and selected. Really? Yeah. He also misled the public about when he was informed about the death of Angelo Quintos, when he had already received a police or already received an email from Chief Brooks. And lastly, it says he blamed business owners on Sycamore Drive, which is a higher mm-hmm. crime area in Antioch, for the crimes that are being committed by others that live nearby, which don't reflect Antioch's theme, Opportunity Lives Here. You know, I do remember when that happened, actually. I think you remember is Marathorb declared that shopping center on Sycamore Drive a public nuisance. And he said that the sh- the business owners were responsible for removing people from the vicinity. They're like, well, if someone's committing a crime, you have to stop them. And the business owners were like, 
Um, yeah, that's not really their I job. can't do that. <laughs> you know, uh, if they, somebody is in the midst of a crime, especially violent, mm-hmm. you know, what are they? Ex- are they supposed to? I mean, I'm sure some do already, but not everybody arms themselves, you know? And well, so I, you're not I don't gonna... think you're supposed to go out and search for a fight in a parking lot. <laughs> yeah, that seems like a colossally <laughs> bad idea to me. you're not a cop. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's, I don't, I don't want to share my own opinion about it, but I can understand the perspective of people who are upset with some of his policies with knowledge of some of the, these incidents that I've read about in the past. Sure. It's also hard too, though. I feel like a lot of the time we only hear about the bad things. That is the thing. And so it would be really nice, this case aside, because I'm still, like, I'm I'm really upset. Mm. You're a public official. Like, mm. get, get it together. Uh, but, you know, it would be nice to be able to highlight the good things that are coming out of Antioch as well. Absolutely. I remember when I covered the Juneteenth. Uh, celebration nice. last year. It was so fun. They were yeah, such yeah. great people. Personally, I'd love to see downtown Antioch revitalized. It's it's beautiful. It's historic. Mm-hmm. You know, there's there's really a lot of life that could be breathed into it and and make it a thriving area. Absolutely. All right, but we're gonna go ahead and move on now. So for the next story, uh, five people were injured and four were hospitalized in a three vehicle crash on Byron Highway just south of Camino Diablo on March 18th. Shortly before 11 p.m., arriving crews found three. Vehicles vehicles, a black Hyundai Sonata, a black Honda Accord, and a silver Acura, all heavily damaged with one woman unable to free herself from her vehicle. It took fire crews around 25 minutes to remove the driver that was trapped in her vehicle. She was then airlifted to John Muir Medical Center in Walnut Creek with critical injuries. One additional patient was also airlifted with severe injuries, while two other patients were transported by ambulance. All went to John Muir Medical Center in Walnut Creek. The fifth patient was released on scene against medical advice after declining to be transported to the hospital. California Highway Patrol officers were on scene to investigate. According to the officers on scene, they believe speed and an attempt to cross the dotted line to pass were factors in the cause of the crash. Byron Highway was shut down in both directions for roughly two hours. So this was actually a scene that I was out on. Mm. And any of these multi-vehicle accident scenes are always total chaos. You know, you get there, there are different cars, the emergency crews are there, and they are assessing all mm-hmm. of the different patients. There are bystanders a lot of the time. You know, I, I call them looky loos. Sometimes they're standing around. So, you know, at first you, you're never really sure, okay, who was actually involved, who was in one of the vehicles and who is just here to... Yeah, who's there to kind of get a look. Yeah, see what's going on. I mean, and it was it was crazy. There was one one vehicle was underneath the the second car was like up and over the vehicle's hood i think you know the second car had two two wheels on the ground and oh, wow. it was lifted up and over um and the poor woman man they were they were starting the extraction when i got to scene this is she was in the third car they were starting the extraction when i got there and they had to cut out the entire like center div- you know the divide mm-hmm. be- the post i guess between the the front side driver's door and then the the rear door mm. just to be able to to lay her seat back enough and pull her out. Oh wow. Um it was it was really bad. And then the driver of another vehicle you know was upright but was having some some really uh severe pains. Um and and I think a, a panic attack. Like it, I mean it was just I mean rightfully so. That is t- Terrifying. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And and there's, you know, I see it all the time. The the comments about Byron Highway. Oh, it's so bad. It is so bad. <laughs> Between Byron Highway and then four past Discovery Bay, there are people people drive too fast. You know, in this instance, it would have been a legal pass uh over the dotted line, but I've been driving out there and people will will go you know they'll they'll cross over the the double solid to pass people. Just, oh yeah, people are just they just they speed first of all. So oh, even one, if you're going sure. the speed limit or you know 5 miles above as is the California normal, um people will still try and pass you if it's a dotted line because there's this whole idea of like you know just being in the front. If you um, need to get there that quickly, leave 5 minutes sooner. Yeah, it's it's really bad. I do remember, this reminds me of an accident that happened, I think in July, where this truck tried to pass people with oncoming traffic coming on the four, 
and he hit a motorcyclist Oof. and the motorcyclist fell in over the levee and into the, into the bank. Oh, this was further out towards or by discovery Bay. Yeah. Am I not, is it the four or is that? No, that's still four. Yeah. It that's goes the all four. the way to yeah, Stockton. No, and then the driver, the truck took off and the person behind the truck was like, Oh, okay. And then took off after them. Cause they had a camera. I think I remember that. And yeah. it was wild. And everyone was like, dude, just slow down. You don't, Need it's not to worth be it. speed racer. You right. don't need to go that fast. It's There's not worth so it. many accidents reported on these roads these days. And I think I did see the mom of one of the other drivers say that her daughter went to the hospital later on to be checked out as well mm. and was released. You know, was fine, yeah, but didn't in a lot pay of pain. for that ambulance cost. <laughs> I don't. Those that's that yeah. ambulance cost is ridiculous. But yeah, no, I'm I'm I am glad though and thankful that none of the girls you know suffered a fatality and that they're yeah. all okay now. I mean, it was um, amazing that is, looking that at is the scene. to get that call that late at night and say your child was yeah, in a car as a mom. Accident, it's a nightmare. I, I can't have, imagine. I have a 17 year old. They're not driving yet, and I think you know getting to that. I, point. I feel like well, no, for sure. But I feel like like part of my job. They see all of the the photos that I come home with, and they're like. You know what? I'm good. I think I'll wait a little bit longer. You're just you like, know. hey guys, you want to see the most recent accident photo? Yeah. <laughs> Do you still want to try to get your license? Yeah. <laughs> Not that bad, but you know, just in, in the process of my working and, and mm. doing everything. But um, you know, just be safe. Drive. It, it goes again. You know, DUI, speed. Like these are all things that are inherently unsafe. Mm. Um, so just don't do it. Yeah, I think I remember last year I was talking to. Someone from the ECC FPD, I was trying to look at statistics for stuff, and they said that while total number of accidents um, between 2019 and 2021 had gone down, the number of expanded accidents or like the the intensity of the accidents had actually gotten worse. Yikes. So number of calls was down, but the intensity of accidents seemed to actually be getting worse. Because people are just terrible at driving now. And for those of you who are not familiar with the term expanded accident, that just basically means it's it's more serious than a fender bender. They might have to take extra precautions. There's multiple cars. Yeah, you know, multiple cars, extra precautions like extrication, um, having somebody needing to be uh, transported by helicopter to the hospital, that would all fall under an expanded traffic collision. Yes. So try to drive safely, people. Please. Next up, Contra Costa County Sheriff deputies and Oakley police shot and killed a man in Discovery Bay this week after police say he walked towards officers with a weapon raised and pointed in their direction during a domestic violence incident. Contra Costa Sheriff Office officials say 51-year-old Robert Jones approached officers with an Umarex air javelin archery rifle that propels arrows up to 300 feet per second as they attempted to speak with him at a residence on the 8,000 block of Westport Circle at about 9 p.m. Police opened fire on Jones after attempting to de-escalate the situation by giving him numerous commands to put his weapon down. Emergency crews began life-saving measures, and Jones was transported to a hospital where he was pronounced dead, officials said. Police were initially dispatched to the house on reports of a domestic disturbance. Prior to the fatal encounter, a deputy first attempted to speak with Jones through a screen door, but he allegedly took out a knife and raised it over his head, prompting authorities to command him to drop the knife. Jones then brandished what appeared to be a rifle at the deputies, who then retreated to a safe distance away from the residence to set up a perimeter. A short while later, as other deputies and Oakley police officers arrived at the scene, the man came out of the residence with the weapon, leading to the fatal encounter. Wow. Yeah, it was it was a lot. That is a lot. And Discovery Bay, too. Well, I mean, crime's everywhere. Like, it is. Let's but be like, real. It's Discovery. You know, I think of Discovery Bay, and I don't think well, sure. no, about shootouts. Fair. But then again, in the past three months, what month is it? I've been it out to Discovery Bay. Like, I was out there for the standoff that they had out there. That and then this. They did have a standoff. I it's do true. That. But let's, to, to be fair, and to dial it back a little bit, this originated as a domestic violence call. Mm. And it doesn't matter where you live. You can be in a community with six gates to get in. Domestic violence is still going to be there. Yeah, And and so that's that's really sad. To me, though, this sounds a heck of a lot like suicide by cop. Mm. You know, the guy knew what he was doing. 
you yeah. know, first they gave he brandished him a, lot a knife. Of warnings too. It's true. And there was a there was a neighbor who said he heard he heard it all. They, he heard the the officers shouting, "Put down your gun! Put down your weapon!" And he kept he kept advancing mm. with what, for all intents and purposes, looks like a rifle. Air javelins are. I mean, it sounds like a deadly weapon. It sounds like a like a rifle version of a crossbow. Yeah, it is. it's a glorified crossbow. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm not a gun person. <laughs> full, I will fully admit to to not being yeah, a gun person. The air javelins they have less of a kick of a real gun, um, but they are just as deadly um, and a lot more painful actually because they. I think I remember reading somewhere that you know when you're hit by an arrow, like to die by arrow, is a lot worse than to die by bullet wound. Um, and so for, to have this dude carrying something that looks like a semi-automatic weapon, I wouldn't um, have been able to tell the, the difference. same potential of deadliness and to just charge at police officers who are asking you to put it down. Well, and, and Contra Costa Sheriff released an image of the weapon that, mm. that Jones had. I absolutely would not have been able to tell the difference. Mm. And it was I was nighttime too. I, right. Again, I was out there. It was dark. It's down at the end of the street. There are not that many lights. Uh, and one of the sheriff deputies on scene even said he could have been holding a broom handle, but it's dark. And, and you know, if he's holding it in a position that looks like he's getting ready to shoot, mm-hmm. they're not going to get closer to check. Yeah. You know, they're they're going to protect themselves and, and the neighbors and, and do what it takes. You know, and it goes back to, again, if you're told, like, just drop your weapon. If you have a weapon, just put it down. It could have ended so much differently. But it was it was really, again... <laughs> just a kind of a, a crazy scene mm-hmm. there were oakley officers at one point you know obviously sheriff was out there um wait oakley Brent, was there oakley was there interesting i think it was like a mutual they call mm-hmm. for mutual aid sometimes how many different departments were there it was if i remember correctly um i saw vehicles from sheriff from oakley and from brentwood pd and then there was also a cruiser that had come in from Lafayette. And I'm not really sure. Mm. I don't know if they live in the area and they were just coming home and heard the call come in. I, I don't yeah. really They could have like had a resource or something. That yeah, they yeah, something for sure. Like that. Um, you know, in situations like this, I don't get a lot. All, the, the information that I get on scene for something like this is more, it's either hearsay from neighbors or like tidbits. You know, they, they did confirm on scene that it was officer involved. Mm-hmm. But a lot of the time, especially with, with county, with the sheriff, we have to wait for the official press statement to come out before we can report anything mm-hmm. better to be factual than first i feel yeah no absolutely it's better to be accurate and right. actually be able to put the truth out 100 percent putting 100%. out a rumor or something and uh and so you know again it was craziness and in my time that i was out there i definitely i saw like no less than five detectives show up in the course of mm-hmm. the 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 couple of hours that i was out there so very busy y- scene yes and it was you know taped off it, and it was just, you know, I I feel for the neighbors, like, there are children that live out there, you know? Oh, my gosh. And, Can you and imagine I, sitting in your house and you just hear gunshots going off? And multiple. I mean, granted, like, I, you know, I've had, I've had that happen. I've been in a house and then I've heard gunshots nearby, sure. you know? Like, but you also kind of live, like, it could yeah, yeah. be. <laughs> <laughs> you live kind of out. I didn't grow up in suburban <laughs> Brentwood. <laughs> so, you know, it's not, you know, it's it happens. But for yeah. people who aren't used to it. That is a terrifying experience. Absolutely. And uh, apparently it's not terribly uncommon for perpetrators in domestic violence situations to to commit suicide by mm. officer. Mm. Uh, there are, I don't know, I don't have statistics, but in my reading and, and looking at different things on this case. But the other thing that really strikes me as, I don't know if unfortunate is the word, but, you know, you think about these, these, air javelins that look like rifles and then actual like airsoft rifles and and stuff like that and yes they they are supposed to have markings that mm. distinguish them from from real actual guns but more times than not people will will take off you know the orange tips on toy guns and yeah, they'll paint them over or they'll paint like them that. or take them off or you know i guess the other issue too is there are criminals that will paint real guns to look like the toy guns. So at that point, how are you supposed to distinguish? You know, and so I feel for the family, it's tragic. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, whatever had been going on before this happened in in the home is quite tragic. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's tragic for the officer. You know, now these officers have to live with the fact that 
that they had to kill somebody. Like yeah. that's you know, even even though you know in in your career it could be a possibility, and you still go into that career, still a tough thing to have to deal. Right, with. Right, like that's still something that that you have to to live with and and deal with on a daily. Mm. Um, and and then then it makes it even more difficult. Yes, this weapon in particular is classified as a deadly weapon, um, and and they were justified in their use of force, but for for cases, you know, you think about cases where there there was no way to mm-hmm. distinguish and it ended up being I, the case that comes to mind for me is the gentleman uh at San Francisco Airport. Mm-hmm. This was back in January. He was brandishing a couple of what looked like rifles um or you know guns and he was shot dead by officers because he could you know posing yeah, a danger to he, himself and yeah. others and so they had to take extraordinary measures. Come to find out, they were airsoft rifles, and he had just painted them to so this way you couldn't tell. Painted them or had taken the 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 marks off or whatever. But you know, if you see somebody with what looks like a high powered rifle, how close are you going to get to check? Oh no! If I ever saw someone in public with like a anything that looked like a rifle, I'd be gone. I'd be gone. I wouldn't be like, oh, is that is that an airsoft? Let me get a closer look. I dip. Right. Yeah. <laughs> You know, yeah, so it's it's it is definitely a tough situation. That self preservation um, just kind of kicks in, and you know, and and I know this argument has been at the forefront in the past couple of, of years for yeah. for many different reasons. This has been a very hot conversation, topic right? For people. And and I'm not a police officer, nor nor would you know that that career path has never held any interest for me. Uh, but I have good friends who are, you know, and it's it's something that. They 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 face maybe not daily but often enough that it should be addressed. Mm. You know I don't have all the answers, but sometimes I like to pretend that I do. Yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. Me too. Yeah. So uh, hopefully we'll get an update on uh, what some of the you know I don't know post scenario information is going to be about you know if what's going to happen with the officer who ended up firing the kill shot um if they're going to do well if there were multiple officers they probably don't know who probably so uh to be updated I guess on for more yeah they're definitely still investigating they're asking the public if they have you know if anybody has any information Mm -hmm, like video footage or, or anything like that so if anybody has any information they should contact Contra Costa County Sheriff. Mm. All right. I, th- I think that's all of our stories. Yeah. That's it for today's episode of Clocked In with the Press. We appreciate you taking the time to listen in, and we look forward to speaking with you in future episodes. If you would like to read more news stories of Contra Costa County, you can do so through our website at www.thepress.net or through our Twitter and Instagram at Press Clocked In. Contact us with your thoughts on this episode or any other episodes before it. That's all we have for you today, and we will speak with you all next time. This is Melissa Van Ruten and Caitlin Gleason clocking out. out.